Okay. All right. Welcome back, Friday, Philip. We are in our series, The Parables of Jesus. Uh, we've had uh, different teachers share with you guys over the last three weeks. Uh, we had Monique did a great job. Bob and Leah uh, brought us in last week. And uh, this week, we're going to jump into the parable of the wedding feast. Um, and this one's a little bit longer, uh, but there's also like a lot of details in this one that has has sent me on this journey through scripture. Um, so I need, here's what I need your help, okay? Um, I need Baruchi. Could you pull up Zechariah 3? Zechariah 3. And, and if, if anybody, if I call on you to read a scripture and you you can't, or you you just can't do that right now. Just let me know. I can call on someone else. So I need uh, Baruchi pull up Zechariah three. Um, let's see. Um, Mandy, would you pull up Revelation three? Yep. And let's go. Um, Leah, would you pull up? Revelation 19. Yep. And then last but not least, um, let's go, uh, Carol, would you pull up Revelation 21? Just have those chapters ready. I'll let you know the verses um, as, as I need them. Um, but if you guys could have those, those up. All right. So here we go. The parable of the wedding feast. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this morning that we get to uh, just use technology in this way to glorify your name, to uh, illuminate your word. And uh, God, I pray that there would be fresh revelation this morning on uh, who we are, on who you are, and and how we are to move forward in this time, in this season, in this era. In this time frame, this Kairos moment, God, how we are we are to move forward. So give us wisdom, give us understanding as we uncover this parable. And uh, God, we thank you that your presence is with us through it all in Jesus name. All right. So um, when we read the parables, I think it's really important that we understand um, who is Jesus telling this parable to, right? Who is his audience and why was he telling them in? this specific parable at this specific time. And when we look at the parables, they're much later in Jesus' ministry. So it's actually at the end of his ministry when he begins to tell all these parables, uh, really to Jews, right? Jews are his audience. And when, it's a really important, like when we read the New Testament, we realize that, um, you know, up until the cross, um, the primary audience, the primary listener, uh, the primary context was a Jewish context, right? Um, so it's important that we ask these questions even as we read the entire Bible. Who is this person speaking to and why are they telling them this, right? Uh, now, up to this point, we're in, we're in Matthew uh, 20, sorry, 21, no, 22 uh, with this parable. But right before this, Jesus has just done the triumphant entry into Jerusalem and he went into the temple and he cleared it out. Remember, he made a whip and he clears out the temple. He flips the tables because they're, they've turned his father's house into a place of, of a, a, a market, right? He's turned his, his father's house into a market. Uh, so he has just done this. Now, think about if you did this, this would probably draw a crowd. Yeah. But well, somebody's going crazy in the temple. They're flipping tables. Everybody come look. <laughs> Everybody come look. So he's got now this crowd of people. And in that crowd, you have uh, the curious, right? You have the people that are, are nosy. What's going on here? Uh, you have the committed, right? You have his disciples there. And then you have the critics. You have these people, the Pharisees or the religious leaders that are supposed to keep everything in order and, and, and on point for, for where they're going, right? These are the different people that you have. So Jesus tells them this parable and uh, you know, when someone like writes a memoir and they change the names of the people 
to like, so you don't really know that they're changing the names, but really, you know who they're talking about. Right. Like you read a book and it's, it's a real story. Um, I just think of all, you know, the, the issues that are going on in Hollywood right now and, and different things in the music industry. And if someone wrote a memoir and changed the names, but you really know who they're talking about. Right. Uh, that's kind of what Jesus is doing here. He's telling this parable and it's like in front of all the people. And he's saying, I'm talking about you. Without saying I'm talking about you. Let's jump into it. Verse one, 22, verse one. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited. See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Come to the wedding feast. Okay, now it's important that when we read the parables, we understand that a parable is a story, right? And every detail in that story has metaphorical value with a deeper meaning, right? So each detail in this of just what I read has value. And he's not saying these things as a made up story just to prove a point. He's actually every single one of those people represent people. OK, so first item in this parable is the wedding feast. OK. The wedding feast. Now, I'm going to even leave a question mark there. What is the wedding feast? What is the wedding feast? I'm, I'm going to leave that there. Then we have the king. Now, the king is obviously God, the father or Yahweh. Right. The king is God, the father. And then you have the groom. The groom is obviously Jesus, the son, Yeshua, right? He's talking about himself. The king had a son and he threw him a wedding feast. Okay. But then you also have, if there's a wedding, that means that there's also a bride. So I'm going to leave a question mark there. Even who is the bride? Who is the son getting married to? Okay. Then you have the servants. Who do you think the servants are? King sends servants out to send out invitations, right? And these are the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament, yeah? And then last but not least, you have the invited, okay? So now you have all the characters of, of this parable, right? You have the invited, and the invited are the 12 tribes of Israel, at least at this time, with the audience that he's speaking to, he's speaking about the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? Now, generation after generation, God has extended this invitation to come to the table only to receive rebellion and rejection in return, okay? Now, there's three kinds of rejection that we actually see in this parable, and I think you guys would agree that as we are inviting people, as we um, you know, welcome people to come to the table as we uh, invite people to a 3D experience. We can experience these same three reje rejections. OK, would you guys agree that uh, the, the reason why more people are not in sales is because there is a fear of rejection and really rejection only comes in three ways. All right. And the first one is apathy. Apathy means a lack of movement. It means uh, there, a, a place of slumber of, I don't care. There's no passion. There's no urgency. It's just, ah, uh, nah, nah, right? Apathy. The first way of rejection, the first kind of rejection. Second one is busyness, right? I'm just too busy. I can't answer the invitation. I can't, you know, I got stuff to do, right? I have something something that is more valuable that I have to go do. And the third one is cruelty, violence, uh, actual anger to the invitation. Why would you invite me to this wedding feast? Why would you invite me to this royal wedding? So those three responses. Now I'm going to read here in verse five. We're going to keep going. But they paid no attention and went off 
one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Okay. And burned their city. I want to point out, look, look at what the prophet Elijah wrote. Now, this is hundreds of years before this. Look at what the prophet Elijah wrote. He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of armies, for the sons of Israel have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left and they have sought to take my life. Okay. This is the prophets, right? The prophets of old. And if you look at many of the prophets were martyred, right? Their lives were taken from them for being a mouthpiece of God. And if, if you understand the apostles, all of them died by being killed or tortured. And even John, right? John the Revelator, the one who received the book of Revelation, uh, he died of natural causes, yet he was tortured. He was boiled in oil. He was exiled to the island of Patmos. Uh, all of these who became messengers, sent ones for God, uh, died a martyr's death. Okay. So I'm going to continue here. Matthew 22. This is verse eight. Then he said to his servants, okay. Now, understand, the city has been destroyed. The people have been destroyed that, that, that came against them. But he still has his servants, right? He still has his, his remnant of people that are still willing to serve him. And the wedding, he said, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. No wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get here without a wedding garment? He was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. So you have some more people that are added to the character role, right? Now you have the bad and good. Who would you say are the bad and good? Who are the bad and good? I'll tell you if nobody wants to jump in. Who are the bad and good? It says, invite everyone from all, all over. Go to the main roads. The Gentiles, right? Us. Anyone of non-Jewish descent, anyone who is not of the 12 tribes, now invite everyone. I want everyone to come, okay? And then you also have this idea of the garment. It's another object. It's not a person, but uh, you could call it a person. Uh, they have this garment that it's a wedding garment, and it's the only thing that makes you acceptable to be in the wedding feast. Um, and I'm going to leave a question mark there. What is the garment? OK, uh, so now. We have to understand that when we read parables, when we read the, the New Testament, there are cross references all throughout the Bible where you can find similar language scattered in different places. And it's important that we we look at these different things. So I'm going to have Baruchi start us off. Zechariah, he's got chapter three, verses three and four. Would you read that for us? Was he not with us? He's illiterate on here and he kicked himself out. What? Okay, I'll read it. Zechariah 3, verses 3 and 4. Now Joshua was, was clothed in filthy garments and was standing before the angel. And he responded and said to those who were standing before him, saying, remove the filthy garments from him. Again, he said to him, see, 
I have taken your guilt away from you and will clothe you with festive robes. Okay. Um, I think, Mandy, you had Revelation 3, right? Yes. Would you give me verse 18? Uh, okay. Um, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Amen. So what are the garments? Just by reading those, like we could speculate about what the garments are, but here we have two examples of garments being changed, right? The proper garments being put on, um, the proper garments being worn, being received. What, what do we think the garments are? Sin and God's grace. Say, say it again. Sin and God's grace. Okay, so you could say that the, the old garments, the filthy garments are sin and that the new garments are God's grace. Uh, I like I like that that way of thinking. I, I think it's uh, it's even more simple than that. In a way. Um, and there's a, a specific word and you know, actually all throughout the Bible, we see sin being covered. Right. Sin being covered. And as sin is covered, what do we receive in return? we receive the righteousness, right? So the righteousness, the purity of Christ, the purity of, of, of God and, and the covering that only he can provide. Like you can try and self cover. You can try and self provide. Um, you can try and buy your best outfit, but it won't actually get you in that in order to get in, you have to be wearing the righteousness of Christ, right? Fashioned from the inside out. Um, who had revelation 19? Me. Leia, seven, seven through nine. Seven through nine. All right. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory because the wedding celebration of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself, has made herself ready. She has, she was permitted to be dressed in bright, clean, fine linen for the fine linen is the righteous, righteous deeds of the saints. Then the angel said to me, write the following blessed are those who are invited to the banquet at the wedding celebration of the lamb he also said to me these are the true words of god mm. right so we see just from this one parable we see now this other language in revelation that is bringing almost more clarity to this full you know this full perspective of what he was trying to uh, um communicate to these Pharisees that hated him, right? These were the, the evil ones that were cruel. They actually treated his prophets with cruelty. Now, who is the bride? Now, here, here's the thing. We often refer to the bride of Christ as the church. I know I'm going long today, but I think I feel like it's for a reason. And we also started a few minutes late, but we, we often refer to the bride as the church. And I wouldn't disagree, but I don't think we actually see that language specifically. Meaning, I think, you know, the Bible talks about husbands love your, your wives as Christ loves the church, right? And so there's that correlation. But we actually see here in Revelation 21 what the bride actually is. And we see this, <clears throat> this coming together. And, and when I read this, you can understand that we're talking about the temple, the new Jerusalem. And you could say that the saints, right, the church, that we are literally living stones fitted and framed together, building up this bigger temple, right? This bigger temple. And this is the final living place of humanity with God, uh, where there is no more sin, there's no more pain. And all has been wiped away. There is a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. Okay, Carol, would you read for me Revelation 21, verse 2? Yep. 
And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Mm. Come on. So I'm going to land here and we're going to discuss for a little bit. I know we'll only have a few more minutes, but this parable ends with this statement. Verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. For many are called, but few are chosen. And I'm actually not going to explain what that means. But I feel like right now, I want to know from you guys here, what the, what do you think that means? Many are called, but few are chosen. I just, he chose us, but you have to choose to be married to him. So many have been called, but few have been chosen. Like he calls us, but few have been chosen because you have to choose to be married to him. Amen. He's he's waiting on our amen, right? Yeah. Any anybody else thoughts? What does that mean? Many are called, few are chosen. I spent about 30 years in the Calvinist church, so you don't want to hear from me. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We, we, we like different perspectives. Yeah. It, it, it's just so de definitive in that teaching that we can't even make the choice. We can't even say the amen without the spirit. So that choice, the chosen are literally chosen and, and, and uh, enabled to choose. Mm. Okay. And is that still where you land now? Well, I've never, I've, you know, I've never really been all in on it. You know, I've heard it explained over and over again, but there's, it has to be kind of a, almost an apologetics kind of idea, you know, because you can see that what the ramifications of that are, you know, if yeah. there's really no way for us to be saved outside of God you know, allowing us to be saved, then, you know, you can, so it's very, it's filled with a lot of problems. So no, I don't stand anywhere in particular on it, but that's just, that was a strong teaching. Yeah. yeah so it's actually interesting that word chosen is, I believe it's a eclectos or something like that. And it it's the same word. It means selected ones. And it, it's the same word when it just talks about the elect, right? The elect of God, uh, it's that same word. Um, so in the sense of election or selecting specific people over others, um, I understand where Calvinists get this from. Um, however, he also chooses to give us free will in this and to, to seek him. Um, so, and we can go, that's a much deeper topic, but I, I do like, I like where, look, this is what stirs up these thoughts and an even deeper study for us at times, right? Um, so let's get some more thoughts. What does it mean? What is he saying? Many are called and few are chosen. I realize that this is a uh, can be a, a challenging question. We're all called, but only the obedient ones are chosen. Mm, only the obedient are chosen. I think Ron Ronell put something in the chat as well. Few will count the cost and deem it worthy. Yeah. And that's where my thought process went was our salvation is free, but it's going to cost us everything to follow mm. Jesus the way that he calls us. I mean, yeah, we're called, but will we choose to lay our lives, throw off the old man, put on the new and truly partner with the Holy Spirit and crucify our flesh and say, okay, I'm all in. I don't know what it looks like, but I trust you. 
I mean, remember what we read in Revelation 3. He said, I advise you to buy from me, right? Gold refined by fire. And white, buy from me gold, uh, white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, right? There is a cost. And it's really, what is that cost? Right? We can't work for salvation. Yeah, I, I would kind of agree. I think I have a little bit of pushback especially with the obedience thing. Okay. Um, just because of the scripture of by one man's obedience, right? All mm. remain righteous. So it's like, how obedient can we be? And is it even enough? And mm. from that, it has to point back to Jesus and say, well, mine can't be enough. And that's why Jesus was obedient. And so again, he, he does everything for us. I think it becomes a natural lifestyle, right? Like it becomes who we are because now we're Christ-like. But I think when we try to be obedient, we fall short. We just allow Jesus to be the obedient one. And then it's just naturally who we become. It's naturally who we are. So then we're not striving for anything anymore. And there's really like this freedom that you get. I can only think of like when I played sports, like when there was this pressure for me to perform and do well, I'd get in my head and mess up. But then when someone would just say, hey, just just go out there and play, have fun. Man, I would do really, really well. And it was because there wasn't any pressure on me for to to perform. And, it, and I think that's what the Holy Spirit does to you. Come on. Yeah. And even the good works, we can do lots of good things in the name of Jesus and not do them with him. And they would be considered as filthy rags. Right but we are not without Jesus and the things that we do with him, right? It's, it's really his work. It's his work through us. So there, there is a surrender to it, but I think, I think you're bringing up a good point that by the obedience of one, right? That all would be made righteous. And all mm -hmm. that the father has given us will are given me will not, be lost any that the father has given me christ said mm -hmm. so there is that element as well that kind of throws a little bit of a not a not about us part to it as well it seems like man let's hear from maybe one more and then we'll pray out i keep thinking about the story of the, the rich young man while you're talking about this and it was like like go give up everything go go just just get rid of everything and follow me and uh not only like we talk about okay god first god first and everything else after that well even further than that there is no such thing as everything else the only thing is to follow jesus and if you follow if we follow jesus then none of that other stuff matters um, because it, in the big picture of things, it doesn't even exist. You know, um, when we go where we go, we're, it doesn't matter who my who my partner was, what my possessions were, what my job was, how much money I had in the bank, whether or not I had a lot of friends. Or two, you know, none of that stuff matters. It's it's just there's only one thing, and that is Jesus Christ. I don't know. That's just my take on it. Amen. Amen. Let's pray out here. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this parable. We're going to keep going next week. Um, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word that it, it stirs up questions in us and not confusion, but questions. And we know that you are faithful to answer the questions of our hearts. And that as we read this, that we would understand it and apply it to our lives in a rightful way that we wouldn't be so quick to apply this without getting the full picture. And God, we're speaking about covenants and different people groups and different times and eras, different dispensations. And Lord, I, I believe that there is a call on our lives to go and invite people 
to the wedding feast. Invite them to come to the table. It's the greatest invitation that we will ever extend to other human beings is to come and sit. Sit with the lamb who was slain for you. Sit with the lion of Judah. For the, the feast has been prepared. It's ready. Come. God, stir up our hearts that when we see people, we would wonder, have they been invited yet? Have they accepted? Have they rejected it through apathy or busyness or cruelty even? And that even in the face of cruelty, we would not step back. We would not stop to invite. We would continue, even in the face of opposition, even in the face of persecution, that we will continue to invite. God, regardless of what happens in this country, in this world, we will move forward. We have counted the cost. Yes, Lord. God, you have our yes. Whatever it is you ask us to do, you have our yes. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.